Hello everybody, my name is Eric Still. Welcome back to Crossing China. And in today's video, uh, I'm just gonna kind of give the people what they want. You know, people still ask me about working in China. And I haven't worked in China in a long time. I quit my job in 2018. Um, but back when I did work in China, I did have some pretty um, interesting experiences, let's just say that. I really am grateful for China, basically, for giving me so many really cool opportunities because, let's just be real here, I'm basically like a normal person, right? I'm just a normal white American dude. And if I had a regular job in America, I probably wouldn't have got some of the opportunities that I got in China. Um, if you want to call it white privilege, I have no problem with that. I know some people don't believe in that, but uh, it certainly exists out here in China, in my opinion. Now, I used to have a job. And in that job, I was hired to be the director of business development for the international department uh, in the company. Uh, when I got hired, there was no international department. So basically, I was one of the first two hires in that department. We we're a very, very big company, very successful. My boss is a multimillionaire. Uh, he claims billionaire. I have no way to prove that, to vet that. I know that he's very successful. He has a lot of money. And one thing that he wants, and one thing that probably all Chinese people want, is face. They want mianza. And that's kind of a topic maybe for another time. Um, but just basically, uh, face is like your reputation. Um, you want to gain face, you don't want to lose face. Losing face is so terrible. Um, and my boss used to always say that face was the most important thing. He had money, he had power, he had, he had this, but he wanted fame. And I guess fame would be another aspect of face. Fame isn't face, but it's an aspect of face. So, uh, as we, you know, he wanted to become more of an international businessman, expand his business outside of China. Um, he wanted to attend events, world events. Um, gain face, meet new people, that sort of thing. So in 2017, we went to the Cannes Film Festival. And the reason why I'm telling you this story today is because the Cannes Film Festival is happening right now. This year is the 75th anniversary of the Cannes Film Festival. Um, 2017, it was the 70th anniversary, so we were there for that, that festival. And uh, <laughs> I just want to share a couple of memories and, and fun stories. Um, so I hope you enjoy. He really, really wanted to go to Cannes Film Festival because he wanted to hobnob, rub noses with people. He wanted to be seen on the red carpet, get pictures, because it'll up his personal brand, it'll up his recognition, name recognition for people in China. Like, you know, if he's seen on the red carpet with, you know, Fan Bingbing was there that year. We didn't get pictures with her, but she was there that year. Um, if he would have got pictures with her on the red carpet, people would have said, Who, hey, who's this guy? Um, pictures would have been shared a lot easier. Uh, so his, uh, that was his goal, one of his goals. We got uh, some VIP tickets, we got to walk on the red carpet. We saw Will Smith, we saw some other people that I don't really care about. I remember there was like a Korean superstar that he got a picture with, but I don't know, I don't really like care about celebrities or anything like that. He made sure we had to get photos. That was the most important thing. Face is the most important thing, that's all he cares about. He has money, he has power. He has all that he needs already. He can retire and live a life of luxury, but he wants face. He wants recognition. His personal brand needs to be, you know, moved up a notch. And so, so the most important thing was walking on the red carpet and being seen. You know, I was, I was pretty stoked. Like we had the, the official car from, you know, the Cannes Film Festival that pick up all the VIPs and take them to the red carpet. It has like the logo of Cannes on the car. And, you know, we're treated like kings and everything. And it was really cool. And so we walk on the red carpet, it's pretty hot in France, su southern France at that time, and sweaty and just, just a, you know, kind of like a long day of, you know, they got to get everybody from the red carpet into the theater. and It's just kind of like a lot of, not hassle, it's fun, it's a really cool experience. Um, but like, it's a, it's a lot, it is, it is a lot. So one thing about my boss is that like, he always works. He worked like 24-7 and he expected everybody else to work 24-7, which kind of sucked because we're not millionaires or billionaires like he is, right? So um, we're working for a lot less money um, per hour, let's say that. But I, it was like me and him, like we hung out all the time, me and my boss. We were always together, always working or always doing business stuff after work or drinking together or, you know, whatever the case may be. But we were always together. I worked with him basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a couple of years. And I had never seen him like sit down and watch a movie either. I had never seen him like sit down and like relax and stop thinking about business. So I was like, I was stoked because like we're at Cannes, which is cool, of course. 
we got to do the red carpet thing, and now we're in the cinema. We got good seats, there's celebrities down there, everything's going great. The lights come down, the opening credits start, and the film was called Loveless. It's a Russian movie. I still haven't watched it, because what I'm about to tell you is, the lights came down, the opening credits started, and uh, it's like a boy or something walking through the snow by a playground. Uh, I don't know if we made it five minutes into the movie, and my boss is like, Eric, let's go. I'm like, what the, What are you talking about? Let's go. Like, this is a Cannes Film Festival. We got to watch the movie. Uh, and he's like, no, we got to go. I can't watch a movie. And uh, so we literally had just sat down, movie started, and then we cut out of there. We left the Cannes Film Festival, not even mid-movie, opening credits. You know, we had VIP tickets. We walked the red carpet. We we're in the presence of celebrities. And that was our Cannes Film Festival viewing experience. Um, so we left and we went out to have dinner and, and had, uh, had some drinks. He couldn't just like think about nothing for uh, two hours. Um, he had to go back and get on his phone and do business. So that was a pretty funny memory for me. Um, probably my biggest disappointment for, with the Cannes Film Festival is that I never got to watch a movie. Um, but other than that, we had a lot of fun. So that was the first year we went to the Cannes Film Festival. That was 2017. And that was probably the most interesting memory from that year from the first time. Now the second year I went to the Cannes Film Festival with him, that was 2018. Um, we actually went about maybe a week or two in advance, I can't remember exactly the dates of the festival, but we went in advance because, you know, the first year we were there, we, like I said, he likes to hobnob and, and meet people and he did all that and he, he did really well the first year, 2017. So the next year he was invited to, you know, pre-parties and events and things like that that we hadn't had access to the first year you know, the power of uh, networking, right? We got invited to this show part event. So we flew from Shanghai to, I think, Geneva, and we we're going to do a lot of events with show part. And one thing they did was they invited us to their, I guess, like their headquarters. Uh, I don't know if it can be considered like a factory, but they were like, have artisans doing jewelry design and stuff. And we got to see the Queen of the Kalahari or the Garden of Kalahari, this, amazing set of jewels, uh, diamonds, um, cut out of one diamond apparently, um, found in Botswana and worth or valued at maybe like $50 million. Um, so that was really, really impressive. We got to see a lot of stuff. But the most exciting thing with Showpart was we also got to go to um, a Cannes pre-party. And there was quite a few celebrities there, including um, Julianne Moore and uh, Petra Nimkova. But okay, so more about my boss is like, I knew from the year before and from all my time working with him that he doesn't watch movies, he doesn't really care about celebrities. The, the only thing he cares about celebrities is that like, just in case he sees one, he needs to like be able to introduce himself and try to get like a good relationship so he can improve, you know, face, Mianza. Um, but he doesn't like care about like pop music or, or movies or actors or anything like that. So we're at this party and Julianne Moore is there and my boss doesn't recognize her, he can't place her. Because, so he's like, who's that lady? And I'm like, that's uh, Julianne Moore, she's an actress. And so he's like, what's she famous for? I can, I can go talk to her and tell her, you know, I like her movies. And like, I'm not like a big like, celebrity humper either. Like, I don't really care. I don't follow like every movie that Julianne Moore is in. Um, but I know she was in The Big Lebowski. And so I told him The Big Lebowski. And you know, my boss is Chinese and again, his English is pretty good. Uh, but he's like, okay, the big, the big Lebow, like, Lebow, Lebowski, Lebowski? Like, he can't say it. It was hilarious. So he's like, okay, I'm not going to tell her that. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know what other movie she's in. Just go talk to her. And so uh, maybe I Googled and told him one. I don't know. But he went up and talked to her and got a, got a few pictures with her. And uh, it was pretty funny because, like, he's trying to, like, relate to her, tell her he's a fan. But... <laughs> I was really I was really a bad assistant at that time because I couldn't really save him um, from himself. But he didn't say that to her. He didn't go up and like stumble over Lebowski. He was very cool and calm like he always is um, and talked to her. So then um, I actually got to talk to her too and she was very nice. I remember I walked up to her and I forget exactly what I said. Maybe like, oh my God, Julianne Moore, like so awesome to see you or something, something stupid. And she was, she was very kind and she's like, she's like, don't call me Julianne. My friends all call me Julie. And I was like, wow, I'm, you know, I'm Julianne Moore's friend now. But actually I looked it up afterwards uh, on the internet and 
her name is actually Julie, and her stage name that she came up with is Julianne. Um, but she was super nice. And then I also met like Petra Nimkova, who is a supermodel or, yeah, very beautiful and also very nice. And then uh, in the picture, you can see she put her, her hand on my chest and my boss was like, oh my God, she likes you. I'm like, dude, come on. She's just, she's a model. She knows how to pose. Uh, <laughs> but it was, it was really fun times, really good memories. So at the party, there was also a mentalist. His name is... Uh, Lior Soutard, he's pretty good. He, had, he put on a good show. Um, we got to do a lot of like up close magic with him in the party. He was walking around. He did some, some stuff. I think he made like Julianne Moore's glasses or something move, something clever. Um, but he, then he did a show at dinner, which was really cool. Um, there was also, I guess, I guess maybe like the queen of, or princess of Kazakhstan or something. I don't know. That's what they were saying. I can't remember. Maybe Turkmenistan or Azerbaijan. Um, I tried to look it up, but like today, but I can't remember who, who it was, but she was very beautiful. Again, I'm not like a celebrity, like humper, I don't care. Like I don't, the only way I would get excited or nervous around a celebrity is if it was like Forrest Whitaker, cause I'd be like geeking out over Ghost Dog and The Shield. I'd be like, holy shit, Forrest Whitaker, you are Ghost Dog. And you almost got Mackie in The Shield. Uh, or if it was like Cisco, who was like, you know, the best singer ever. So those, those would be my two ones that I'd freak out over. But like Julianne Moore, Petra Dimkova, they were awesome people, very nice. But uh, but I didn't, I didn't really care. Um, so yeah, that was that was good times. And then one other story from this uh, Cannes Film Festival experience was, uh, so my boss again, I was like, when we're overseas, I was basically like his assistant. I was do everything for him. I was basically his little slave. So I remember we we're gonna fly back to Shanghai, and we were at the airport in I guess I think it was Geneva. He always carries like all, you know, designer bags and designer handbag and designer clothes. And he obviously is very wealthy. You can see it when he, how he dresses. He was checking into his flight. His, we, were we were checking into the flight. Uh, I was at the station next to him uh, at the counter and he was at the other counter checking in. And he put his bag on the floor, his backpack. And in his backpack, he always carries, you know, money and fancy stuff. Um, He's an easy target, like if you're looking at him, you can see he has money, that's what I'm saying. And so the airport's kind of crowded, you know, pretty packed, and somebody came up right behind him. And again, I was checking in at the counter right next door. So somebody came in, came close right behind him, also with a black backpack, put it down next to his, and then picked his up and took off. Obviously it was a thief. Um, so he was checking in, I saw that, and I was checking in, and I was like, oh shit. And my job is to protect him, basically. Not a bodyguard, but you know what I mean. And so, so I chase this guy down and my boss sees me chasing him. He comes chasing the guy down too. We stop him and I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like, what are you doing? And the guy says, oh, I made a mistake. I thought this was my bag. Obviously my boss's bag is like Gucci or something like really nice. And his bag was just a basic empty like black backpack. And he's like, oh, 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 it's not my, you're right. I got him switched up. We switched back, back the bags. We went and got on the plane, and we didn't really pay attention to what happened to that guy. He probably stole somebody else's bag. Uh, that's really not what's important. What's important is that... <laughs> so we had a stopover in Moscow in Russia. Eek, Russia, right? And uh, <laughs> it was like eight or ten hours. And of course we had access to the lounges and stuff, first class lounge. When we went to the, the airport, my boss was like, you need to watch my stuff, make sure nobody steals my stuff. You know, be on top of that because I don't want another thief to come. We went to the first class lounge and in Moscow, at least the lounge we found, it didn't have like private rooms to sleep in, um, but he wanted to sleep. So he put his bag basically next to me and said, watch my bag, don't let anybody take it. And so we had like eight or 10 hours to sit there, the layover before we went to Shanghai. I seriously sat there for like probably 10 hours, just sitting there watching his bag and my bags. But he's like, don't, you know, if somebody steals my bag or steals my stuff, you know, you're going to get it, like, not threatening me, but threatening me. I sat there and I watched his bag in the first class lounge for hours and hours and hours and hours. And uh, at the end of the day, we got back on the flight and came to Shanghai and all was good. You know, we had a couple of successful Cannes Film Festival trips two years in a row. But after the second one, I remember we had a, a big meeting in the company because in China, you always have big meetings. After the second Cannes Film Festival trip, like my, I think my boss wasn't that happy with me. It was right around the time I was trying to quit. And uh, 
So I remember he embarrassed me in front of in front of basically the entire company in the meeting. He's like, you know, Eric isn't loyal. Eric doesn't care about his boss and all this stuff. And and like trying to make me lose face because face is the most important thing for him. And I remember I wanted to stand up for myself so bad. I was like, you know, like I stopped the thief and then I watched your bag. I didn't even sleep for like probably like 20 or 30 hours straight because of the flights and that I didn't sleep at all during the, lay the layover. It was one of the last straws. I can say it was one of the last straws because right after that uh, trip to France and him basically embarrassing me in front of everybody was, uh, we had a few more trips already planned. We, we had a trip to Hong Kong and Malaysia, uh, back to France for, for the Cannes Film Festival. Basically it was France and then China and then Hong Kong and then Malaysia and then back to Europe. Uh, all in a span of like two weeks, it was crazy. At the end of that, I actually quit when we went back to France together. Or maybe I got fired, I'm not entirely sure. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think that was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back was that trip to France, where I got like basically like berated and in trouble for, for protecting his bag and his money and protecting him and staring at his bag for hours on end. Um, but yeah, overall, like the experiences were still good and I think back, on everything now and that job was pretty brutal but I, I did really have a lot of really cool experiences and so I'm not gonna say it was worth it but uh, some aspects were worth it and so that's what working in China can be like in a way my experience is very unique and I'm very grateful but um, I would say that one aspect that rings true for all people working in China at least in like a professional capacity is that you have to like be deferential to your boss no matter what your boss, uh, you cannot make your boss lose face, you cannot embarrass your boss in any way, in any time, or else you're gonna get in some deep shit. And if they do wanna bring you down a peg, they have every ability to do that because you're always having meetings and you cannot stand up to your boss. Uh, so if they wanna embarrass you in front of everybody, they can, so that's, that's what working like is like in China. And I hope that was kind of interesting to people. I don't know if it was. So I, I do I do plan to finish my memoir at some point. It's basically done. I just need to publish it. I also need to edit it first and probably rewrite some sections. But uh, it's been done for like a year or two. And uh, I don't know when, when I'm going to do it. But there will probably be more stories similar to like this and more fleshed out. This was just kind of like a off the top of my head memory. And uh, I hope it was interesting. I hope it didn't ramble too much. And that's it. So bye-bye. And... Let me know if you want more stories from working in China, especially for that guy, because I had some fun ones.